we begin. Uh, first, I'd really like to thank everybody for coming today, taking their time. I know you guys are extremely busy, but I believe this is a, a very important topic uh, and something you guys should be very aware of. And I'm hoping you guys can get a better understanding of what the term forced organ harvesting is, uh, especially in China today. I'm not sure how much knowledge you guys have about the topic, but after you leave here today, you'll get a basic overview. Uh, my name is Damon Noto. I'm one of the spokespersons for an NGO called Doctors Against uh, Forced Organ Harvesting. And it's an NGO that started after uh, 2006 when we started to really investigate and scrutinize what's going on with the organ transplant community in China. I want to give everyone a little bit of background so, so we're, we're all in the same place. The U.S. and the medical community around the world, especially the transplant community, they have been following the transplant situation in China now for many years. Probably the past 13 years, uh, the transplant community became very alarmed about what was going on in China. Uh, and basically, China went from a country that was executing a very small, I mean, sorry, transplanting a very small amount of uh, organs every year uh, to very quickly becoming the second largest country transplanting organs around the world uh, behind the United States. And they did it in a very fast period of time, which was very alarming uh, to us in the States. It took the States decades uh, to be able to transplant in the number of thousands and then ten, over 10,000. But China seemed to have done it over the past, in, in, over a, pa a few years, they were able to get to that number, which was very alarming. And then when we looked at it and found that traditionally Chinese people don't like um, to be, uh, to pass away and not be buried with all their organs. So in their culture, it's not very, uh, they're not very willing to be organ donors. Uh, and that's true across the board in China. And when we look at that fact, and then we looked at the fact that um, they didn't have a public organ donation system that we have in the U.S. or a distribution system that we have in the U.S. So in the U.S., this this concept of being an organ donor took years uh, to really establish in the United States. It took a lot of public awareness, a lot of driving force to get people to sign up. And so now you see on your license, yes, I'm an organ donor. If I, if I die, please use my organs. It took us years to get to that state. And we have probably about 100 million people now as uh, active organ donors who are people willing to give their organs. Uh, in China, they don't have this type of system, um, and they've tried to implement it, and they've uh, pretty much failed uh, miserably. And they don't have this distribution system that we have in, in the U.S. And what I mean by that is someone gets an accident in California, they pass away, and someone in New Jersey matches that person's kidney. We have this distribution. We, we can get it very quickly from California to New Jersey. China, it's not like that. Their, their system is very locally based. You know, they're getting their organs from um, the hospitals or, in this case, the prisons that surround that region. So they don't have this type of distribution system that we have. And that's important because something you should understand is that when someone dies, your organs are not viable very quickly. Um, heart is actually ours. Within a day, you can't use a heart. Within, within a couple of days, you can't use a kidney. So it's not like someone dies and you can stockpile these organs. They have to be used quickly. Uh, so the match has to be found quickly and needs to be distributed. So when we, when we looked at all this and the medical community started saying, well, how is China transplanting all these people? It was very alarming. And it wasn't until uh, 2005, 2006, where we finally got China to admit, yes, they are doing this and they're doing it through executed prisoners. Uh, and once that happened, we actually was able to, we were able to do a lot of scrutiny of what's going on in China. There's a lot of independent investigational journalists. Um, there's a lot of doctors' organizations all trying to do research about how China is doing this. And we've collected a lot of data. And since 2006, we've come to know a lot of things. And we're no longer at the point where I believe we can say it's questionable. To me, it's, it's a fact. They're executing prisoners for their organs, and they're executing prisoners of conscience for their organs. And we'll go into that in the presentation. Um, and why I say that is, and why that's important, is because we're now at the stage where I believe action really needs to be taken. And I, I, I hope all you guys have heard about the House Resolution 281, which was just released at the end of last month. And it's, I think, a very important uh, resolution. And if you read it, you can actually learn a lot about 
the organ harvesting situation in China. Um, and we'll, we'll go into it more later, but I, it's an important time for, I feel, the U.S. to act. And we have enough data to support why we should act. The international community has already taken a lot of steps, and we'll review that today. There's a lot of countries actually doing a lot of things, and we haven't stepped forward as much as some other countries. Um, we're going to cover three main things today. We have three speakers. The first one is really going to give you a background about organ harvesting in China, some of the key data we have, key information. Our second speaker will go into why this group, Falun Gong, has, has become one of the worst victims of this uh, crime against humanity and why they're a particularly vulnerable group. And the third one, we'll talk about the international response so far, how forced organ harvesting in China affects us here in the United States and what actions we may be able to do uh, to prevent it, um, what steps we can take. So our first speaker uh, announced today is Dr. Mei He, medical doctor, PhD. He's currently an ass assistant professor of pathology at Alpert Medical School of Brown University. He's also a staff pathologist and medical director of the hematology lab in the Woman Infants Hospital in Providence, Rhode Island. He graduated from Shanghai Medical University in China. He did his pathology residency at University of Medical and Dentistry of New Jersey. He also did a PhD at UMDNJ. He continued his fellowship at Memorial Sloan Kettering in New York City. And he currently serves as a deputy director of Doctors Against Forks Organ Harvesting. So let's welcome Dr. Mei Ha. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you very much for coming. Uh, the title of my talk is uh, is uh, Forced Organ Harvesting in China, Deranged uh, Transplant Medicine Requires uh, Urgent uh, Actions. As said, uh, more than, uh, according to China's uh, own data, uh, more than 10,000 cases per year was performed in China. Okay. And uh, as I said, this is the second largest in the world, only second to U.S. But uh, there are many major obstacles uh, to getting all the uh, organs uh, in China. Uh, as I said, like uh, culture barriers and a very low rate of uh, voluntary organ donations and uh, no effective uh, organ donation and sharing system uh, established yet in China. So question came, like, uh, where did the organs come from for these like, more than 10,000 cases a year? So to get organs uh, in 1984, the communist government legalized the use of uh, organs from executed uh, prisoners. They had this uh, temporary regulation of uh, utilizing death penalty prisoners' bodies or organs. And uh, this is in violation of all ethical guidelines of major medical organizations, such as the World Medical Association, uh, WHO, which is the uh, World uh, Health Organization, uh, the Transplantation Society. And from the very beginning, the Chinese Communist government has been trying very hard to hide this practice, denying lying, covering up, making like empty promises. And this is an article from that regulation made in 1984. And you can see, they said, this practice must be kept secret. And the doctors involved in the organ harvesting are not allowed to wear the white coats. And uh, so for the past 20 years, the communist uh, government has been doing this. And in, I'll give you some examples. Like in 2001, Dr. Wang Guoqing uh, did his uh, testimony before US Congress regarding the organ harvesting from uh, executed uh, prisoners. And the Chinese embassy uh, denied and called Dr. Wang as a liar. So they have been uh, trying very hard to deny uh, this uh, practice. But in 2005, a Chinese official admitted the use of uh, organs from the 
prisoners, executed prisoners. Uh, Dr. Huang Jiehu, who is the former vice uh, minister of health in China, and he himself is a transplant surgeon. Uh, he said more than 90% of the organs came from the executed prisoners. So why, after so many years of denying and uh, hiding and covering up, they admitted that in 2005? So something bigger at uh, stake. What crime, bigger crimes, they try to hide? To answer that, let's look at the uh, data, okay? This chart shown here is uh, Chinese government's official data. Dr. Huang published this and presented this like, uh, in uh, international medical journals and the conference. This is uh, a chart of the numbers of uh, liver and kidney transplant by years in China. You can see a light blue bar is uh, uh, kidney and the, the pink bar is uh, liver. So you can see the left corner, 1997, there were only 3,000 uh, transplant in China. To 2,500 uh, in 1999, maybe here is better. And then go to 2003, you have about 6,000. And then in 2004, you saw a big jump. Uh, if you combine the, add this number together, 10,000 kidney transplant and uh, about uh, 2,200 uh, uh, liver transplant and other uh, transplant together, you will get a, a number, 13,000. But actually, according to Chinese media's report, own report in 2005, the number of organ transplant performed in 2004 was up to 20,000. So you can see that's a big increase. And if, as uh, Huang, Dr. Huang said, 90%, more than 90% of the organs came from executed prisoners, then let us ask the questions, can executed prisoners provide enough organs to support this increase? To answer that, we have to understand the um, organ transplant. The transplantation medicine is one of the most challenging and complex uh, areas uh, of medicine. It requires a lot of efforts, teamwork, sharing, communication, well-established uh, organ donation, sharing system, and uh, all these. And to get the, the organs to support that uh, fast increase, First, you have to have uh, enough prisoners to be executed to get the organs. And the second, these organs need to be healthy so they can be used. And uh, as said by Dr. Noto, uh, these organs have to be transplanted as soon as possible. Uh, so all these need a well-established infrastructure and uh, organ sharing system. And let us look at in China, what's the situation? So, uh, while this uh, organ transplantation in China, the number increased fast, over the years, the number of executed prisoners remained quite persistent or even slowly going down, okay? And also, uh, th considering the uh, comorbidities these prisoners uh, have, for example, uh, Chinese population has a very high uh, rate of carrier rate and uh, infectious rate of hepatitis, and also thinking about those criminals involved in this like drug abuse. Okay, so the best, the best, the maximum, uh, only less than 30% of the prisoners, their organs can be used. And uh, uh, putting uh, the temporal and the spatial consideration into consideration, and the lack of the infrastructure and the organ sharing system in China, uh, so the, the use of organs is local. Uh, what does this mean? It's like uh, the organs taken from local prisoners can usually only be used for local patients. China does not have a organ sharing system. And uh, uh, in the most uh, ideal situation from one prisoner, one liver and two kidneys 
can be harvested, uh, harvest, harvested. Uh, but uh, because of the situation in China, uh, without this sharing system, uh, actually, in most of the cases, only one organ can be used. All the rest, so-called, quote, quote, wasted. So uh, let's come back to this uh, uh, official data from the Chinese government. Uh, this, again, is the data for, uh, published by Dr. Huan. And uh, the purple here, this one purple box is the number of kidney transplant. And uh, this uh, light blue is the number of liver. And uh, what we do is like we, we move this, uh, the light box uh, to the top of the purple box. So, so make a sum of the number of uh, uh, liver and the kidney transplant. Okay. So you can see uh, these uh, things is the uh, sum of the liver and the kidney transplant numbers. And uh, you can also see the red dots. Red dots represent the number of executed prisoners uh, provided by Amnesty International. And you can also see the blue dots there. So what are these blue dots? These blue dots represent the, the most ideal, most perfect situation. 100% of prisoners, all prisoners, their organs are used. And uh, in every prisoner, three organs are harvested, including one liver and two kidneys. So this is the most perfect situation. So let's see, uh, can their numbers cover So if you compare what the maximum number of the organs can provide by these exec executed prisoners in the most perfect situation, you still can see this dashed box representing the number of kidney and liver transplantation that cannot be explained by execution. So adding these years together, uh, there are more than 30,000 organs. You cannot explain their source coming from the executed prisoners. And uh, what I said is just the most ideal, perfect situation. And in reality, we know less than 30% of the prisoners, their organ can be used. And they, in most of the cases, only one organ from them are used. So this picture gives you a kind of like a global view of the national situation in China. And then let's look at a few like uh, individual examples. So this slide shows you uh, two screenshots from uh, Chinese uh, transplant uh, uh, hospitals. The, the, the up one is the one uh, from the Tianjin Oriental Transplantation Center. Okay, so you can see from 1998, they only did nine cases up to like 2004, they already did 1,600. So over this short period of time, what a big jump, you know, jump. This is really an explosion, an exponential kind of increase, okay. And the bottom one is from another hospital, which is the number two hospital uh, of the army in Shanghai. You can also see the same similar situation. So numbers, has a lot of information, but numbers is not the whole story. There are striking features associated with uh, the organ transplant in China. Uh, I can share some uh, personal experience. When I was uh, doing my pathology residency in New Jersey, I was very often paged or called to hospital uh, during midnight or early morning. Uh, so why I have to go there to do a frozen section? Uh, to check the quality of the organs uh, extracted from the, from the donors. You know, if they are healthy, so these uh, organs can be used. So like uh, in transplantation medicine, everything kind of like follows the, the extraction of the organs. You know, the, the clock starts to clear cut. This is a kind, of like a, a kind of like a military action. So uh, you know, knowing this, it's a, a big surprise or it's a Astonishing for some Westerners when they go to China, they, they saw the situation in China. So I'm going to show you two examples of the Western physician's experience. The first one is uh, from uh, Dr. Imer from uh, um, 
Uh, he's a, a Swiss physician. When he was uh, visiting China, he was invited by a hospital to watch a heart transplantation operation. You know heart, right? When you get the heart out, the, 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 the donor cannot survive. It was killed. He was surprised, like uh, the time of the operation can be set, can be determined at their convenience. So it's really a big surprise to them. So this is another like a, a kind of like those kind of uh, you know, clicking clock, those kind of like military action. This is like you very relaxed, you know, walking into a restaurant, uh, walking into a supermarket to have you no know, orders. And the second one is from Israel, uh, from uh, Dr. Lavi. Uh, one of his patients told him like, uh, you know, in two weeks, uh, uh, he has a heart uh, transplant scheduled in China. So this is also kind of like a very, very striking, astonishing to Dr. Lavi. And uh, then I'm going to show you a case uh, from China, according to China's own media uh, report. Uh, that happened uh, in Xinjiang, where the Uyghurs uh, are living. So in 2005, uh, Dr. Huang went to Xinjiang to please him. You know, he has this kind of like a, a hobby. When, wherever he go, the local hospital like to uh, please him to arrange a, a kind of a case uh, for him to perform his uh, operation. So in this case, uh, in that time, the Xinjiang local hospital uh, gave him a potential, the first case uh, in China of uh, auto transplant to, uh, to treat uh, hepatic cancer, which is uh, the liver cancer. Okay, so that is uh, using the patient's own tissue to kind of like a transplant and uh, to treat the uh, liver cancer. But as a backup, you need uh, organs, you need uh, a, like a backup uh, livers from other people. So according to this uh, Chinese media report, uh, as a, you know, to get a backup liver, Huang, Dr. Huang contacted where he came from, the Guangzhou, to get a organ within 24 hours. Okay, and the local Xinjiang hospital also arranged to get a organ, a liver, you know, all within 24 hours, used to uh, for this operation. So, yeah, by our thinking, like uh, if uh, in this country you need a like uh, to get these uh, two livers uh, within these 24 hours, you need to have a perfect uh, like a legal car accident. And this, uh, uh, the, the victim uh, has to be like uh, uh, assigned a organ donation card, and uh, which in, in China is almost zero. And uh, you know, their parents have to, their family have to agree very quickly. So, and their organs are extracted and uh, fly. It's kind of like from Houston to Seattle. So all this has to be uh, within, uh, also almost a mission impossible have to occur within 24 hours during the oper operation. And uh, they did it. And uh, not only they did it, they got two, right, within this. Uh, and uh, so to satisfy uh, Dr. Huang's hobby to perform this potentially number one case uh, in China, uh, two, two liver has to be, have to be extracted. So no one in that time can survive this uh, like uh, organ harvesting. So two people have to die. And uh, Dr. Huang's case is that the isolated case. And this is uh, uh, actually talking about uh, the issue of waiting time of organ transplant in China. Uh, the average time there is from one week to four weeks. That is seven days to 28 days. By comparison, in this country, is the waiting time for organs is two to three years. That is 750 to 1,000 days. And uh, this one just sh showing you a screenshot from a Chinese uh, hospital, which is a very famous hospital in Shanghai, uh, which is a uh, Chanzhen Hospital. It says the, the waiting time is one week. And this is another one from the International Transplantation uh, Assisting Center. And uh, their claim they can give you organs immediately. So a uh, summary of what I have been talking so far is like behind China's fast increase in number of the uh, transplants, uh, there's a big gap, a huge gap between the official number and uh, what the executed uh, prisoners can provide. And there must be, there must be a alternative source of organs which can provide very large numbers of organs and this is uh, on demand and uh, which, and the sh very short waiting 
time indicate a living pool of donors available. So who are the victims of this uh, organ harvesting? In 2006, uh, the first uh, uh, report of the forced organ harvesting of uh, Falun Gong practitioners, of the 10 Falun Gong practitioners, was released to public by the woman in the picture. Uh, her name is Anna. Uh, she is the ex-wife of a, a transplant surgeon in China who was involved in the forced organ harvesting of Falun Gong practitioners. And after that, uh, there, were several, there were several separate independent investigations. What's shown here is uh, from Canada uh, by uh, David uh, uh, Matters, who is a renowned uh, international human rights attorney, and by David uh, Kyogu, uh, who is the former Canadian Secretary of State for Asia and the Pacific. And their conclusion by their investigation is like uh, 41, uh, more than 41,000 organs uh, during the period from 2000 to 2005, the only explanation is from Falun Gong practitioners. And Ethan Goodman and uh, Gutman, uh, an independent uh, journalist, uh, he did his uh, own investigation. And his inclusion is like uh, uh, during from 2000 to 2008, more than 65,000 Falun Gong practitioners harvested, harvested for the organs. So there are more evidence. For example, from uh, Meta's uh, investigation, they, uh, they conducted uh, like a phone uh, interview of uh, Chinese doctors in China. Like uh, more than 17 hospitals, uh, doctors admit they got organs from Falun Gong practitioners. And uh, there are other, other many interviews. And while uh, sub, like, uh, brutally tortured uh, in detention, the Falun Gong practitioners are subject to medical examinations and they include urine test, blood test, and uh, EKG, uh, and uh, some physical examination, eye exam, x-ray. So what's about this? What is the point of doing this? So if you look at it from the organ transplant point of view, it's not hard to understand, because these are to access the quality of the retail organs. The organ is going to be transplanted. And uh, some more details, like uh, some uh, inmates, Falun Gong inmates record the, uh, the, the guards mentioned, like uh, remove the organs. Some, some like Chinese official even yell at, uh, yell at those uh, Falun Gong practitioners who did not want to renounce their faith. They say, if you don't give up, we will send you to organ harvesting. Here, not only the organs is uh, harvested for sale, but also organ harvesting become a means of persecution and uh, kill. And they also, you can see at the bottom, like when torturing Falun Gong practitioners, specific instructions like not to hit kidneys uh, or eyes because these are useful. This is a very bloody, you know, uh, statement. And uh, you know, time-wise, uh, the increase in number of the organ transplant in China actually parallel with the persecution of Falun Gong, uh, that which is started from uh, 1999. You can see after official initial some kind of like lag, and then you can see a quick jump. So in summary, uh, China is uh, violating uh, ethical standards by, in the past, you know, harvesting organs from executed prisoners. But now, this come to a new stage. It's a very large scale organ harvesting, forced organ harvesting from prisoners of conscience this is a crime against humanity. This is a very terrible crime. So actions from international community are required to end this crime. Because why? The Chinese government has been doing this, denying, you know, hiding, covering up, making uh, empty promise. They won't do anything to change this. We have to take action to end this terrible crime. Thank you for your attention. I'd just like to drive home a couple points to make sure um, we're clear. The, the fact that um, transplant surgeons in the U.S. and in Europe were being asked by China, do you want to come and, and witness um, a heart transplant being done in China? And they were asked, well, um, what time of day would you want to come? You want to do it in the afternoon? You want to do it in the evening? You want to do it in the that was shocking to surgeons. And the other thing that was shocking is when patients would call Chinese hospitals and say, I, I need a kidney. 
And they say, well, you, can, you have one in about two weeks. And then they would tell their doctor in the U.S., well, I'm, I'm scheduled for a transplant in China in two weeks. And they would be like, what do you mean? They, just, they told you the day? Yeah, they told me the day. And in fact, they would go there on that day, they would get their transplant, and they'd come back you know, a month later or so, and indeed, they were right. They got it on the exact day they were told. That, that type of thing was shocking to transplant surgeons. Uh, the other thing I, I'd like to mention is that in his presentation, he, he talks about these numbers. How do we get these numbers? And he mentioned a lot of these numbers come from China themselves. The Vice Minister of Health actually did a, a presentation at one of the international transplant conferences in Spain, and he had a, his whole presentation, and he, he, these were his numbers. These are not our numbers. We were using his numbers, and, and he, in fact, stated in that conference 90% of the organs were from executed prisoners. Um, to talk about an atrocity, I just want to put things in perspective. China executes more prisoners in the, uh, per year than all other countries in the world combined, by far. It's not even close. And then you add to that that not only they're executing them, but they're, they're taking their organs, they're harvesting organs and selling them. You add to that that these people were most likely not given the same type of trial with due process that we have in the Western standards of the US, where you actually have a lawyer and you have a court case, is completely different in China. So you have these people who are sentenced to death row without a fair trial, executed, organs taken. It's come to the point today, though, that when you add prisoners of conscience on that, that a lot of times they didn't even have a trial. And now they have the ability to do what we call live organ harvesting, which means they can put them under an anesthesia-like state keep them alive, harvest as many organs as possible, sell them, and then kill the person. I think this is an atrocity we haven't really even seen before. And this is why I think this is such an important topic. You know, uh, many people probably have heard in the news about uh, the guy who tried to, uh, Wang Li Jun, who tried to, tried to uh, go to the U.S. Embassy to get uh, uh, to, to escape China and, and, and a seek amnesty. This, this was a guy who was involved in thousands of organ transplants, and he helped design these new medications that they can use in China uh, to keep people alive while they're har harvesting their organs. So, um, our, our next speaker, Mr. Levi Browdy, uh, is going to cover a very important topic about why Falun Gong practitioners, this group of people, have been uh, subject to one of the biggest victims. He's the executive director of the Falun Dafa Information Center, which is a nonprofit NGO that compiles firsthand accounts from inside China and issues reporting concerning the persecution of Falun Gong and its impact around the world. Falun Dafa Information Center was founded in 1999, shortly after the Chinese regime launched its persecution campaign against Falun Gong. It's been one of the primary sources for news and analysis in the crisis in China for the past 14 years. During this uh, time, Mr. Browdy has been interviewed and quoted in the New York Times, Wall Street Journal, Associated Press, Time Magazine, AFP, and other media outlets. Uh, he's also presented at forums here at Capitol Hill. Currently owns and operates a financial software company in, the, in New York where he lives with his wife and two children. Let's uh, welcome Mr. Levi Browdy. So again, I want to thank you uh, for coming to hear about this topic. I, um, it's near and dear to my heart. It's near and dear to a lot of us. Um, obviously, it's very gruesome. And I think one of the big questions is, um, how is this possible, something like this in the 21st century? Um, I'm going to talk, spend about 15 minutes and talk about that. How is it that this group of Falun Gong practitioners in particular have been made so vulnerable to this kind of a crime, and how has it been able to, to go on for this long? Let's start with Falun Gong, because I think we really need a background to understand how, what it is and how it evolved in China so we get a sense of how, how again, how these forced organ harvesting atrocities have occurred. Falun Gong, quite simply, is an advanced system of the Buddhist school of teachings. Um, Falun Gong teaches the principles of truthfulness, compassion, tolerance. Uh, people who practice Falun Gong takes these principles as a guide to their daily living, um, try and uh, adopt these principles into their character as they deal with people and they go through their days. It involves a city meditation, slow motion exercises uh, such as these. So some characteristics about Falun Gong. Um, all the books and instruction are freely available online. You can download the books, you can learn the exercises there, and, and away you go. Um, people who practice, particularly in China, but especially around the, also around the world, 
across the socioeconomic spectrum. We're talking about very high-ranking military leaders in China, peasants across you know, the, the land in China, housewives, business people, uh, they're from all walks of life. Um, Falun Gong is very much adopted in someone's regular life. If you're a soldier, you keep being a soldier. If you're a housewife, you keep being a housewife. If you're a business person, you keep being a business person. It's something you adopt into your life. You, you learn the principles, you apply them to your life as you see fit. Um, there's no membership, there's no registration, there's no money transactions, nothing to sign up for, to pay for, anything like that. Again, the practice is freely available uh, on, online, and you can learn it from your friend, you can learn it online, and so forth. Um, and today it's practiced in over 100 countries around the world. Um, now, these attributes are important to understand a little bit on its growth in China, and again, how things were set up for the forest organ harvesting to occur. Also something to note, particularly about Chinese society, um, self-cultivation, this tradition, is something that's very ingrained in traditional Chinese society, going back for 5,000 years, out of which came Buddhism, Taoism, Confucianism, other types of disciplines. The idea that you can apply principles, exercise, meditation to your life, improve your health, improve your outlook on life, improve how you deal with people, how you manage life. Um, and Falun Gong is really, it comes from heartland China. It really ushered in what I would call a renaissance of this kind of tradition, um, especially in the modern China where from 1949 up until today, the Chinese Communist Party has been going through a series of campaigns to stamp this out. Because if you think about it, communism is an import from the West, completely foreign to the land of China. And they spent decades trying to root out traditional culture and leanings of the Chinese people so they can still the communist ideology. And so Falun Gong was actually a return to these traditions, the return to the moral traditions, the exercise traditions um, about bringing family and communities together. When it was first, in, it was first introduced um, in 1992, it was made public by Mr. Li Hongzhi. Um, he lectured for only two years, um, 50 some odd lectures, 54, 56 around China. And from then on, it was all word of mouth. Um, people told their family members, their coworkers at school. Um, I first learned about Falun Gong from a Chinese coworker. He learned it because he went back to China and he was taught by his mother. His mother learned it from her friends and so on and so forth. And this happened throughout China. And pretty soon by 1998, you had Falun Gong in, in parks and college campuses throughout China. Uh, I had a friend in uh, Xinhua University in 1998. There was practice sites there, professors were there, students were there. It was a very vibrant activity um, in 1998. Um, and by that time, 70 to 100 million people were practicing Falun Gong in China. And by the way, those are Chinese government numbers. That was their estimations when they were looking into Falun Gong to try and see how many people were practicing. That's an enormous number of people, even in a country as populous as China. Um, one of the reasons it grew so much was the pure, it worked. I think as one, as one Chinese friend has put it, uh, particularly in the area of health and wellness. There were two surveys um, notably done in Beijing and Dalian that, turned, that, that returned uh, unprecedented results in terms of health improvement, stress reduction among Falun Gong practitioners in, in those two cities. Um, there was also a series of government endorsements, which is uh, not quite like it is here in the US. Um, um, in, in the Chinese society, that's a big deal. And you had things like, in this case, the then number two person in the country, Zhu Rongji, coming out saying this is a fantastic thing. And it's also something the government embraced because it's free and it's, it's actually, it's like a safety net for the healthcare system. Um, everybody's practicing, everybody's becoming very, very healthy and they don't have to spend a penny. They loved it. Um, so this was widely promoted by the government. I've got friends who learned Falun Gong in Chinese embassies in Paris and New York and so forth. Um, Mr. Li Hongzhi and Falun Gong were also given several awards by the, by the government. And I, this is something I want to drive home. So again, we're talking about the most populous country in the world, and one out of 13 people by the end of 1998 are practicing. All right? That's a lot of people. So how did the persecution start? Uh, the common narrative in the media and even academics is saying it started in, in July or April, July of 1999. Uh, when Falun, a large number of Falun Gong practitioners went to Beijing to demonstrate against some abuse some of their fellow practitioners in a nearby city were, were suffering. Not really true. Um, s a few certain leaders in the upper echelons of the Communist Party had been going after Falun Gong since as early as 1996, trying to ban the book, 
um, harassing people who are practicing, sending out spies to practice sites and trying to figure out who's practicing, who's not, um, that kind of thing. April 25th came along when uh, it's sort of a series of events culminated where uh, a series of practitioners were beaten and detained in Tianjin, very close to Beijing. The practitioners saying, we came peacefully and said, hey, you can't be doing this. And they said, you got to go to Beijing. And they were told to go to Beijing. The word got out. And pretty soon, you had more than 10,000 people gathering in Beijing on April 25th. And that was when the world first heard about Falun Gong. That's when it first made headlines. Um, over the next several months, um, which I'll get into a little bit later, there was a tremendous power struggle at the very top of the, the Communist Party. Uh, Jen Zemin, the man leading the Communist Party at the time, wanted to crush Falun Gong. Most everyone around him did not. There was a tremendous power struggle that went on. Finally, in July 20th, John Zeman persevered. And outside of the legal authority of his office, he ordered that Falun Gong be banned. And people started to be rounding up, taken from their homes in the middle of the night. On July 20th, put into stadiums by the tens of thousands. And thus started, essentially, a new cultural revolution, um, where if you practice Falun Gong, if you were supportive of Falun Gong, you were automatically an enemy of the state, an enemy of society, an enemy of anything they could come up with. Um, you had a return to a lot of abductions from homes. You had, t again, a lot of people rounded up in stadiums. Public book burnings. They'd take Falun Gong books and materials out into the street and they'd burn them and people would gather around and watch this. Um, State-run media blitz defaming Falun Gong out of fabricated news, they'd have trucks going through the streets with bullhorns saying, you cannot practice Falun Gong anymore, it's this, it's that, and so forth. Um, a lot of pu public condemnations, a lot of so-called study sessions, uh, where you have to come in, you have to write out what your thoughts are and turn that into an official, and if they don't like what you write, you're punished, you have to do it again, and so forth. Um, these are uh, Associated Press pictures of, of that time period, a Falun Gong practitioner being uh, detained in Tiananmen Square, and some of the public book burnings I was talking about. It was a very systematic campaign. Uh, almost overnight, Falun Gong practitioners lost all rights, very similar to, to the lead up into World War II in Nazi Germany. You got ex uh, fired from your job, expelled from school. You could not get a hotel room. You couldn't rent a facility. Um, in many cases, your pensions were taken away, things of that nature. Uh, a lot of abductions, as we'd mentioned, a lot of Falun Gong practitioners being put into forced labor camps, prison camps, so some of the black jails, um, all without due process. Physical torture, psychiatric abuse started to become very, very rampant in the later part of, of 1999 and 2000. However, it was a real struggle because, again, you're talking about, as I mentioned before, and this is why I talked about it, Falun Gong was really deeply rooted in the hearts and the minds of a lot of Chinese people. It was a return to their traditions. It was more Chinese than anything they'd experienced in many, many decades. So this didn't just go over with the people overnight. Jiang Zemin himself had to take a tour through China, had to implement many things to finally get people to understand, the officials and particularly the rank and file, that if they do not carry out this persecution, their career and their livelihoods is, is at stake. If they do, they will be promoted. It became the litmus test of whether you succeeded or did not in Chinese society. Uh, there was a groundbreaking article in 2001 by the Washington Post, mainly John Pomfret, who was the um, bureau chief there at that time, that identified a specific campaign, a three-pronged campaign of violence, brainwashing, and propaganda, um, interviewing some of the uh, Chinese officials that were going, going after Falun Gong at that time. And this is how they were going to do it. This is how they're going to stamp out Falun Gong and try and rid it of the, of the country. The violence was, there's a long, long list of torture methods that have been refined and actually uh, enhanced on the Falun Gong practitioners over the last 14 years. This is a, a list of some of them. Brainwashing was very, very common. And it took many different forms, a lot of which, again, harken back to the Cultural Revolution. Uh, study sessions where you had to study uh, completely fabricated material about Falun Gong, that it's evil, that's this, that it's that. You had to get that into your head. You had to thought, write thought reports, and you do it again and again and again and again until they're satisfied that you no longer believe in Falun Gong and you're not going to practice anymore. Obviously, that's surrounded with the violence and the torture that's going on to you during the, during the day in the, in the prison camp. Um, your family and community has gone after. They bring in your family members and, and, and have them pressure you. Um, they'd have your husband or wife divorce you. They'd have your grandparents, your children come in um, and put pressure on you. So again, they're trying to come at you from all aspects of society. The brainwashing was, was a big part of it. Propaganda was huge. The media in China is state-run. Uh, the message in China is state-run. 
Um, and so there was a, a flood, literally a flood of Falun Gong material, particularly in those first years, 24-7, uh, newspapers, television, and so forth, uh, attacking Falun Gong. Um, in particular, some cases, they would do stuff like there was a homicide in some city and some crazy person killed somebody. And the next day, the local news which covered it, suddenly all the news is gone. Two days later, Xinhua, the national news agency, publishes a news story saying, ah, oh, this person was Falun Gong which was never part of the original narrative. So they did stuff like that. They would take cases, they would fabricate cases, all to sort of present this idea that Falun Gong is somehow dangerous and you need to be, uh, stay away from it. Um, and this was going on for, for years. Couple that with complete censorship. Uh, China controls its internet probably more than any other country in the world. Um, you cannot get any objective information about Falun Gong. You can, whether it's coming from the New York Times or it's coming from a Falun Gong website itself. Um, if it has positive material on Falun Gong, uh, it will be purged from that, from that website and you can't get it to it from China. Um, and it made also a, a very difficult for academics to report on Falun Gong and journalists in, in, in Beijing and around the area to perform, report on Falun Gong. So this had catastrophic results and, and we'll get into the numbers in a little bit, but I wanted to talk about a couple cases that I'm very close to it because I followed these from, from day one. Um, these are just a couple faces of what's happened. Uh, Gao Rong Rong, she was an accountant, 31-year-old accountant. Uh, she was fired because when the persecution first started in 1999, uh, a few years later, um, Chinese officials picked her up. She wouldn't renounce Falun Gong, and so they beat her with an electric baton around the face and other sensitive parts of the body. The result is what you're seeing here in the photo. Why do we have the photo? We have the photo because she was so desperate of the torture she was, she was undergoing, she jumped out of a second or third story window down into the street, obviously injuring herself. People got her to a hospital. Local Falun Gong practitioners were, sympath were sympathetic to her, got to their hospital, and actually were able to get her out of the hospital before the, the Chinese officials could know about it. They were actually monitoring her there. She was able to stay in hiding for a couple of years, and that's how we know about this case. In 2005, she was picked up again. By June 16th, she was dead um, in Chinese custody. Ma Shui Jun, um, another case, 49-year-old man, big, strapping fellow, um, that went, underwent about uh, a year of torture in police custody. And the second picture you see on the right is the result, extreme emaciation. This is not uncommon in, in prisons with Falun Gong practitioners um, as they go through the torture process in the labor camps and prison camps. So back to the numbers. And I think, again, the numbers are a key important factor here. Um, these, these numbers are enormous. Um, 70 to 100 million people practicing in 1998. How many people now? Very difficult to tell. What we do know is there are 20 to 40 million people who are active in China, um, peacefully doing something to try and end the persecution, whether it's hand out leaflets to their neighbors or, or do these kinds of things. That's a large number. Approximately 1 million at any given time being held in the various forms of detention that you have in China, whether it's a formal labor camp or prison, a black jail, or what have you. Um, over 100,000 tortures, reports of torture, over 3,000, 3,500 3 reports of death from torture. And again, these are just the cases that we know about. These are the cases where someone knew and cared enough to risk the danger of collecting this information and disseminating it outside of China. This is obviously just the tip of the iceberg. And then as you heard from the previous presentation, uh, some of the estimates uh, on the number of Falun Gong practitioners that have died from organ harvesting are at 65,000. So one other factor to take in mind, and, and that is the, the first point up there. A lot of Falun Gong practitioners, when they are picked up from police or they go to Tiananmen Square to demonstrate or they go to the local government office to protest this abuse they're facing, will not carry an identity card. They will not tell who they are, where they come from, why. Because if they find out their family's implicated, their company, their, fam their, their coworkers are implicated, they don't want to do that. So you have a large number of Falun Gong practitioners in custody with no identity trail. That's also true because a lot of Falun Gong practitioners may be coming from rural areas and they don't have identity cards necessarily and no one knows who they are. So you've got a lot of people, of the a million some odd people that are in detention, you've got a large section of those people that are completely unidentified where no one knows where they are. So if you put all these things together, and we'll start from the bottom, 
an enormous number of people in captivity, many of which no one knows where they are. They've been dehumanized over 14 years of, of, of propaganda that people who would not necessarily be torturers have no problem torturing. And you've seen this, I think, in genocides in recent you know, decades with whether it's Rwanda and so forth, that, that that component, the dehumanization of the victim is key in order to have people do the kinds of atrocities we're talking about. So that's been going on for 14 years. You've got a, um, the state publicly saying, we're gonna eradicate Falun Gong. You've got people who have no, po no political rights, representation or what have you, and they're widely known for being healthy. These are people who've engaged in meditation, they don't smoke, they're sort of, they're very known for a healthy lifestyle. It is the absolute perfect situation for to make a ton of money extracting organs and selling them, and they make a ton of money. This is millions and millions and millions of dollars being made out of this situation. So in many ways, it's a perfect storm. Um, I have a couple questions that often come up. I won't get into all of them here, but I just want to cover one because it comes up so often, and I think it's important to cover it. A lot of people question why. Why go after Falun Gong, given who they are, there's no economic benefit, apparently, outside of the organ harvesting. There's no social benefit from, from targeting a group of people, even in an oppressive regime like China. And I think you have to keep in mind a couple of factors. First of all, Falun Gong's popularity. There are more people practicing them than the members of the Communist Party itself. That alone is going to trigger some alarm bells in some leaders of the Communist Party who needs to control everything within the state. The second thing is the ideology that I've already talked about. You know, they spent 65 years trying to instill Marxist struggle atheism into the Chinese people, which has 5,000 years of very traditional Buddhist and Taoist-based beliefs. Um, these two, two things are very antithetical to each other. It becomes more um, marked today where the Chinese Communist Party has done more to build and, and control the country through corruption. And then you've got a whole group of people that are untouchable. They're not into corruption. They're going to return to sort of the moral values of the past and being very traditional. So there's a class of ideology there. Um, and then this is perhaps one of the most tra tragic portions. One man, Jiang Zemin, who was the head of the Communist Party and the head of the military at the time the persecution started. Um, he was the first leader of, of Communist China who had no really uh, credentials from the revolution. He wasn't really respected. He came to power out of the, the chaos that ensued of, of Tiananmen Square. His whole mission, after Deng Xiaoping died in the mid-1990s, was to build up his own credibility, build up his power base, which he really didn't have much of. Along comes Falun Gong and completely steals his thunder. At the time when he's trying to get the entire country to worship him and respect him as the supreme leader, they're all talking about this great thing called Falun Gong and how it's wonderful and it's a return to the past. It became very personal for, for, for Jiang Zemin. Several investigators, including, I think the most notable one I know of is Willie Lam, who was a senior uh, correspondent with CNN at the time. I think he's with the Jamestown Foundation now. He, was, he got in, interviewed some of the senior um, Chinese leaders who said over and over again, this is very personal for Jiang Zemin. A lot of the Politburo, that tight group of seven, eight, nine people that run the country, did not want to do this. It was Jiang Zemin that wanted to do that because of these reasons. Um, and that's really why you have the situation with Falun Gong, and as we mentioned, the, the circumstances there, that's why we've had uh, the ability to have this atrocity to occur. So let me leave it there, and we, if there's questions at the end, we can cover those. There is a, at the last, after the last speaker, we will have a question and answer, and you can ask the speakers questions, so we will save time for that. Um, one point I'd like to drive home, um, when Doctors Against Forced Organ Harvesting first started to look at uh, forced organ harvesting in China, we started to become aware that they were using prisoners of conscience, and we started hearing about Tibetans, Uyghurs, and Falun Gong. One of the main uh, things that became very obvious to us is that we, we did see a lot of isolated cases of Tibetans, but it was in the Tibetan region. We did see cases with Uyghurs, but again, that was in the Northwest in that region. Only Falun Gong was available or had organs available across the country. It was a nationwide persecution. So it became very clear to us that that was one of the main sources uh, of prisoners of conscience. Our last speaker will talk about the international response its impact on the U.S., forced organ harvesting, and what we can do. 
He's Dr. Jin Chao Xu, MD, PhD. He's currently assistant professor at Mount Sinai School of Medicine in New York. Uh, before that, he was assistant professor at Yale Medical School. He received his MD from Hung Yang Medical School in China, his PhD from Yale. He also completed his postdoc research as a tra and training as a kidney specialist. Professor Xu has published over 30 articles in the field of kidney disease in peer reviewed journals across the country. He also serves as the, one of the board of directors for Doctors Against Four. Let's welcome Dr. Shu. Thank you. Oh, good afternoon. Um, Thank you, uh, the organizer, for inviting me for this important uh, topic. And uh, yes, indeed, I traveled and I gave uh, many uh, testimonial and uh, as expert in my field. And uh, as one person put it, yes, we are seeing a new form of evil. My topic today is to is going to focus on what has been, do, has been done in response to this exposure of atrocity um, in many different countries, different organizations, and prof professional societies. And uh, as a doctor and a um, kidney specialist, I'd like to start with real numbers. And just to put things in perspective, when we're talking about transplant, in our country, this is a great shortage of organ supplies. For example, uh, this data is from Department of Health. We have, in a given year, we have average about 117,000 people who need organ transplant. And uh, only one quarter of those candidates can get transplant. And we only have 12,000 people who are willing to donate their organs. And this is a, a, a graph. I'd like to direct your attention to the left panel. And uh, as you can see, for example, for kidney transplant, any given year, for example, at 2011, we have about 57,000 people who need a kidney transplant. Among those 50,000, we only have, next slide show, we only have about 17,000 people who can get the kidney transplant. In other words, only about 20, 25% of people who need an organ uh, transplant can get the organ uh, transplant. So um, the problem of global organ shortage, this is not just in our country in the United States. This is happening in other countries in China, mainland China, and uh, many uh, other European countries as well. This, this is a global problem. Such global organ shortage leads to illegal organ trafficking. We often hear from the newspaper, the news media, people will travel great distance to get the organs uh, paying money, and uh, also this is also called organ tourism. And the third one we have already heard from these two previous uh, presenters, we have encountered uh, new forms of uh, organ transplant, that is forced organ harvesting. Forced organ harvesting is the medical professional deliberately kill the living healthy individual to extract the organ to implant to the patients who need the organ. And this is a sort of a new definition in our medical community. And who are these victims? The donors, quote unquote, we have heard from Dr. Um, uh, her and Mr. Uh, David Browdy, the, major, the main victims are foreign gun practitioners. The numbers depends on whose investigation uh, our conclusion is range from 30,000 to 65,000 people were killed for the organs. And based on that, we uh, doctors uh, in this country we formed an organization called Doctors Against Forced Organ, organ Harvesting. And the purpose is to investigate and expose 
this kind of evil atrocity against humanity. In addition, we have also started with other, myself and with other two doctors, Dr. Uh, uh, Arthur Kaplan in uh, University of New York, as well as Dr. Centuria, we started a, a grassroots petition called We the People. Last year, within 30 days, we have collected over 25,000 signatures. Now we are waiting for the administration to give our official response. So given that what we have known about forced uh, organ harvesting, what has been done? Uh, in the next few slides, I will give you some details what has been done uh, from different countries, different governments, uh, states, and also professional societies. I will talk about at different levels. In the academic level, also uh, as well as the communic medical communities, we have done a lot. And we have educated uh, our doctors about the forced organ harvesting at the different international uh, meetings, journals, and uh, uh, the local hospitals. And uh, many professional journals, peer-reviewed journals, have made a policy that based on their findings, their investigation said no publications from China if their data is derived from executed prisoners or organ source is not clear. And uh, even in certain hospitals, they have made policy changes stating that we're not going to train any transplant surgeons from China if they cannot sign a pledge that they will not go perform forced organ harvesting when they finish the training and go back to China. This hospital initially started at the Prince Charles Hospital in Australia, and we're pledging we are many other hospitals and training center to do the same. As you may know, University of Pittsburgh is the transplant center of the world, and many breakthroughs came from that center. And uh, in, the last, uh, in the past March, we had a forum and similar to this, and we are pledging when we are asking many other people, many other organizations, such as University of P uh, Pittsburgh, to join this a pledge to ban the training of uh, the surgeon, transplant surgeons from China if they cannot promise that they will not engage in such illegal organ harvesting. At the federal level, many things have happened. We had two congressional hearings back to back last year, one is in September, one is in December. And I will discuss more in the next couple of slides. And more importantly, about a month ago, as pointed out by uh, Dr. Nato, we had this resolution, House Resolution 281. And this is milestone achievement in our country. We have proposed this resolution, and we're hoping that we can get enough sponsors and uh, pass this resolution. And uh, as I mentioned, in many ac academic journals and professional society, they have already taken steps in reaction to this forced organ harvesting. Just to give you an example, uh, in 2010, there was a World Transplant Congress meeting. There were over 30 abstracts was rejected from China because of the data is derived from uh, executed prisoners. And many professional societies and uh, journals adopted similar policies. For example, American Journal of Transplantation, Journal of Clinical Investigation, Lancet, those journals are the best of the best in our uh, profession and very, very well respected. And uh, the US uh, how Homeland Security also officially expressed their concerns in response to this forced organ harvesting in China. 
And uh, now they made a new change. When the new applicants, foreigners, come to this country, they need to sign a visa application form called a DS-160. In that form, a new questionnaire was added. Here, in, have, here second in this uh, red circle. The new question reads, have you ever been directly involved in coerced transplantation of a human organs or bodily tissues? That clearly sends a clear message to the people who are engaged in forced organ harvesting. Tell them we are watching you. And I, there are two congressional hearings in the Capitol Hill last year back to back. One is in September and one is in December. I was invited as a, a witness to testify in front of the Congress. And the second uh, congressional hearing, the title was Falun Gong in China Review and Update. It was sponsored by Cong Congressional Executive Commission on China. And the chairman was Christopher Smith, congressman from New Jersey. And uh, Mr. Smith has pledged that in response to And uh, Mr. S Smith pledged to prohibit patients going abroad to re receive illegal organ transplantation, to l limit health care insurance coverage for those who receive organs from unclear so uh, sources. And in addition, similar to Jacob's Law, Persons involved in forced organ harvesting will be banned entry to the United States. Those are great proposals. That's going to be very effective to put a stop, at least slow down the pro prosecution and also for the operation of forced organ harvesting in China. Now let's talk about what other countries have done. I'd like to start with Israel. And in response to this exposure, the investigation of forced organ harvesting, they have taken concrete measures. In 2008, they passed a law. The law says anybody, Israeli citizens who are engaged in buying, selling, or in a brokerage of organs, whether you are within Israel border or overseas, is illegal. And also the mandate that the insurance will not cover the medical expenses for patients who receive uh, such organ transplantation. The results is phenomenal. The transplant tourist decreased from 155 to 26 cases shortly after the law was implemented. And not only their policies, not only to uh, cut the, uh, to stop the illegal organ harvesting, but in the meantime, in parallel, they adapted policies to increase the organ donations. As a result, their domestic organ donations increased 68%. So the net results actually they promote organ donations and benefit Israeli citizens. In Malaysia, the new laws also were adapted. Back in 2007, they have an Anti-Trafficking in Person Act. And later on, they amended this act because taking organs or tissues from a, a person without consent was considered part of trafficking. In addition, in 2012, starting 2012, January 1st, they have mandated for any person who received organ overseas 
illegally, the government will not cover the anti-rejection medication. That put a stop. You know, many patients were contemplating to go overseas to, to receive the illegal organ transplant. In Europe, there are many, the, the, recently they had a hearings in EU Parliament this past January. They discussed those issues. Many um, stating that they're gravely concerned about, about this forced organ harvesting in China. In Australia, serious legislation drafts was proposed, and a law was passed this spring which makes it illegal to use organs from executed prisoners. In addition, most importantly, the new bill introduced by Mr. Shawbridge and make categorically organ tourism illegal. In Belgium, in 2000, this year, they had human tissue amendments. They make it very clear in response to this forced organ harvesting in China, stating that anyone who receive organ, buy, purchase organ, or acting as middleman to make a profit for organ transplantation is illegal. Similar things was discussed and the, um, the contemplating similar um, policy changes in UK. In Spain, they passed a law in 2010 that specifically stating that it's illegal to travel to China to receive organ transplant. They're very specific on China's issues, very specific on the forced organ harvesting in China. They're even stating that it's illegal to even advertise to go to China to receive organ transplant. In Taiwan, there are many changes uh, happening as we're speaking. Last, uh, the end of last year, they passed a new law requiring that Taiwan citizens who received organ transplant must report to the Department of Health within three months. And uh, as early as this past February, they had a week-long international conference just on the topics of forced organ harvesting and ethics of organ transplantation. All of us invited the speaker. That speaks that Taiwanese government, medical professional, they are very much concerned about what is going on in China. And we are looking forward to for uh, new policy changes, and legislative changes. So I haven't give you some uh, brief snapshots of uh, what, is, uh, uh, what other countries, states have done in response to forced organ harvesting. What can we do, the United States of America? Well, people may have questions stating that what's the relevance to our country, to, our, to US citizens? But I can tell you, as a, a medical doctor, as a kidney specialist, I take care of patients who get a kidney transplant. And I can assure you that many, many U.S. citizens who need kidney transplant, they will travel to China. They have traveled to China and came back. And we need to look, take, care of, take care of those patients. And the expenses to take care of patients often is much, much more than patients who get kidney transplant in this country. So it is re relevant to us. And in addition, we have the most advanced trading centers, medical centers for transplant surgeons. Only we should not continue to train those Chinese surgeons if they are still engaging in forced organ harvesting after they finish the training. And uh, this House Resolution 281 is great milestone achievement. We're hoping that many congressmen and representatives, senators, come forward to support, to be a co-sponsor to pass this resolution. For many reasons. Our country is a great nation. 
we are viewed as uh, the champion of human rights. If we can set this example, pass this resolution, we can send the message loud and clear to China, to the rest of the, the world. And this not only will benefit the Chinese citizens, the victims who are in this forced organ harvesting, but I think that will benefit the United States. And also we help other states, other countries, professional societies, they can adapt their similar policies in response this, uh, to this forced organ harvesting. To conclude, organ, organ transplantation is a life-saving procedure. The global shortage of organ supply opens a door for illegal organ trafficking, organ tourism, and forced organ harvesting. Countries have imp implanted and contemplating new laws and the legislative policy changes in response in the forced organ harvesting, illegal organ transplant. We believe U.S. should play a leading role for the legislative changes to stop the forced organ harvesting. And together, we will make a difference. Thank you. So I'd, I'd just like to drive home this last couple points. One is it, it impact in the U.S. Uh, it definitely impacts us. We do have patients continue to travel to China for organs. We do continue to train probably the largest number of transplant surgeons uh, for China. We continue to be a major training ground for them. And we have no uh, laws or regulations that um, inhibit our pharmaceutical companies, our medical device companies from doing any clinical trials in China on any type of organ transplant um, surgeries. So it's, it's, it's quite attractive to them because they can do very large numbers very quickly. Currently we have no regulations on them whatsoever. The question, does, um, does these, do these things, resolutions, does it, uh, do they make a difference? I often get asked that. And I say absolutely yes. You know, I, I've lectured around the world, and almost always the first question I get from whatever country I go to is, what is the U.S. doing? Tell me. What's the U.S. doing? Before, before, before we do it, what, what is the U.S. doing? Everybody wants to know what, what, what's Congress doing, what's the Senate doing. When, when Congress and Senate moves, it makes it easier for other countries move, it makes it easier for the medical organizations to move. Everybody asks me about the AMA, the World Medical Association, International Transplant uh, Society. These societies want to know what Congress thinks. They want to know what, what, what American uh, Congress and the government is doing. It makes it easier for them to have a firm footing to pass uh, regulations and actually put pressure on China. Uh, this resolution by the House 281, which was introduced by Ross Lettinen and Mr. Uh, Andrews, bipartisan. Uh, to me, I think this resolution saves lives. I think it makes a real impact. I think it puts pressure on China. It makes it more difficult for them to hide things. It really makes them, it forces them to try and comply with what the rest of the world is doing. They do care. They do care about what the U.S. thinks. They do care about public opinion. And their doctors, when they go to these conferences, they do care how they're perceived. Trust me, it, it does, it has an impact. I, I hope we can take a few minutes to, if you guys have questions, we have these uh, panelists here. We have the availability, you can ask any, any question um, and direct it and, and see if we can get your um, questions answered. So why don't, why don't we start first, the gentleman in, in the back. I still don't understand the fundamental question which was brought up earlier when uh, said why. Uh, why is this, such a threat to traditional um, government, is it seen as potentially a military threat? Why would they take on it? What is seen as What is more specific? Because I understand how it leads into this. Why is it seen to be such a serious threat to the government to the degree that they would want to torture? Um, I think the, the first thing is to understand is it's not, and the Chinese government knows that, and they knew that when they started the persecution. The persecution was not out to crush a threat per se. 
It was to advance. It was mainly, let's start with Jen Zemin. It was mainly about um, what I talked about where he's trying to build up his own um, legacy. And Falun Gong, I guess you could call it a threat in that regard because it was stealing his thunder. And that was a real big thing. And I think that's hard for us to wrap our minds around in the West. How could one man take 8% of a population of a country and say, you're illegal. You're not a real person. We're going we're gonna to do whatever we want to you. How could that be possible? It's tough to sort of get my mind around that, having been raised in a civil society. But after 14 years of kind of studying the history of the Chinese Communist Party, you know, the thing with, and that brings me to the second part of my answer is, you have to look at the answer not in Falun Gong, but you have to look at it in the Communist Party. The Communist Party came to power not because they're economic wizards, not because they're technological wizards, understanding international trade, how to lift people out of poverty. They came to power because they understand political campaigns. That's what they understand. They understand how to manipulate people's thinking and control people through terror. And with one of the first things they came to after they came to power in 1949, they right they started killing off all the landowners, all the capitalists. That was the first campaign. Then was the great leap forward. Conservative estimates put that at 20 to 30 million people dying. Cultural revolution, another what seven, eight million people. So there's been cycles every five or ten years where they go after one segment of society, and one of the primary purposes of doing that is to scare everyone else that says, if you get out of line, if you ever challenge our power, this is gonna happen to you. They did it with the capitalists, the landowners, the academics, the intellectuals. They did it with the students in Tiananmen Square. Falun Gong was the latest chapter. So I think um, it is a complex topic. And so I don't wanna belittle it by, by giving you too short of an answer, but um, not that I'm doing that. But I think that the key, the key answer to looking, to, to, if you're going to answer why, you've got to look more at the CCP. You've got to look at the Chinese Communist Party and not so much at Falun Gong. Could have been someone else. Could have been another group that happened to be 70 million people strong. Um, it was just Falun Gong was the, was the next one in line. Yeah. I, I know everybody's busy. If you have to leave, please, we have extra copies of the House Resolution 281. Please pick up a copy before you leave. Any other questions that were unclear during the presentations that you'd like to ask or have the presenter make it a little bit more clear? Um, the, you referred to House Resolution 31. Does it um, refer to its symbolic impact? Does it have a um, practical impact? Or is it just about the symbolism? Practical impact on us in the U.S. or practical impact in general on stopping organ harvesting? Yeah, I'm preventing Well, I don't know if many people are aware, but China had recently uh, announced that um, they're going to do a lot of promotion uh, for their medical tourism, medical transplant, and, and I believe I have, uh, it's coming up later this year. They're going to have a big conference in Shanghai promoting their medical tourism and what they can do. Um, it impacts directly that. It impacts when we let people aware, we restrict people to be able to go and use this form um, to get organs. I think it has a direct impact on saving people's lives. If, if you're asking me, uh, can it save lives directly and, and even people in the, uh, can it affect people in the US? I think it has a direct impact in that if people are aware of what's going on in China, and there's actual regulations, laws that restrict people from going to China for forced organ harvesting, which this resolution might be very helpful in coming about. Uh, I think it does have a direct impact. Yeah. One thing I think we've seen uh, with other resolutions and other things like it inside China is that it has an immediate impact on would-be persecutors in, in the rank and file inside China. When they learn that the Congress is condemning the campaign that they're part of, that has a very tangible impact in the warden or the, the police in a prison camp or a detention, or de detention camp around China. So I think um, that document and the fact that Congress has acted and made that kind of public statement does have a very concrete impact inside of China, independent of what's happening in the U.S. and internationally. And uh, to be more clear about providing ammunition for medical organizations, you know, the World Medical Organization in 2006, I believe, 
they said to China, you know what, if you want to be part of the World Medical Organization, you need to promise that you're going to stop executing prisoners for the organs. And a year or two later, yes, they said, you know what, we promise we'll stop. But even until this past year, their own Vice Minister of Health said, no, we're still doing it. Hopefully we'll phase it out in five years. And the reason I mention that is we need to give these organizations like the World Medical Organization ammunition to say, you know what, you, you said you would stop, you really have to stop. We're going to not let you be a member of the World Medical Organization. We're going to put pressure onto you until you stop. But if the U.S. government's not supporting it, they don't get strong support, I, I, it weakens their stance. Because, and, and I've met with people from the AMA and the World Medical Association, and they, they do feel like sometimes their hands are tied. But I think we would untie their hands a lot if the U.S. Congress and the Senate were strong on this point. Uh, regarding the measures taken in Malaysia, is anything like that um, going to be proposed here um, in terms of medication for people that would travel abroad and then come back so that um, the healthcare fraud enforcement could actually go after people buying and selling the medication? We're hoping this is the case. This is a very practical approach to stop uh, among many uh, forms of uh, uh, means. Um, like uh, um, Malaysia is doing that and uh, it's very effective. I met uh, uh, Dr. Ahmad Ali uh, at the, the international conference in Taiwan and he talked a lot about his experience. He's uh, uh, the person who um, basically pushed forward for this uh, amendment, uh, new changes. It's very effective. And um, we are hoping that um, we can do similar things in this country, um, for not only for to uh, stop the forced organ harvesting, what's going on in China, also for our economic reasons. Because when those patients come back, it adds a big economic burden for the uh, healthcare insurance companies. They cost a lot more to take care of those patients because often they have more complications after surgery. And more uh, uh, complicated is that nowadays when they do this kind of surgery because of the exposure of this forced organ harvesting, since become more difficult. It used to be when patients come, come back to home, they have a stack of paperwork stating that where the organs from and uh, how the uh, operation went. Now when they come back uh, to their home uh, country, they have nothing. They have no names, how the organ, where the organ is from, what's the health status of the donor. And it makes it very difficult to track. Therefore, it's very difficult to treat if the uh, complications uh, arises. I said before, we're, we're behind other countries. You know, we don't even have in the States a regulation where if patients want to travel abroad to get organs. Uh, they don't need to tell anybody. We, it's very hard for us to track these, uh, these numbers. We don't have any regulations or anything that's, uh, you know, regulating this from happening. So we, we need to take some even beginning steps to try and help uh, stop this. Uh, further questions? Yes. Also in terms of awareness, of course, things like this help, but it shocks me that I wasn't even aware of this until this week, <laughs> to be honest. Uh, you know, so I guess what can we do? in terms of just creating awareness of this in the first place? Yeah. We, we've been shocked, too, because we've been working very hard to get this information out and trying to reach a lot of media. Um, and, and maybe Mr. Browdy can touch upon it. Sometimes this is a tough uh, topic for the media to uh, touch upon, and we haven't been that successful in some of the major medias. Um, uh, this resolution actually talks about uh, issue, the United States would issue a travel warning advisory to citizens. That would do a huge impact. Uh, if we could have some type of tra travel advisory, at least said, if you're going to go to China, you, you should be aware that this may be from an executed prisoner. That would help physicians in the United States tremendously. You know, we haven't even, you know, Taiwan, other, these other countries are way ahead of us uh, for that. That would do a very uh, good job. Uh, I don't know if you want to touch upon, you know, this, this is something the media, we haven't had uh, some of these larger medias uh, pick up. Well, I think the thing you mentioned, I mean, the resolution itself is going to be a real catalyst for that. We've seen that in other resolutions. Um, and I just sort of, 
again, the, we can't ignore the, the impact it's going to have inside China. I know what you're talking about is the awareness here. But when uh, we've had other resolutions about Falun Gong per persecution and related matters here in the U.S., and when those come out, it's a bit of a media event, and that itself can give legs to the whole issue. So I'd say that's, that's an important item. But we'd also like to hear suggestions, because we're a little bit befuddled by it as well. <laughs> yeah. Um, I don't quite understand how health insurance organizations, say somebody goes from this country, goes to, let's say, China to get an organ transplantation surgery, and they come back to the United States, and then they need health care insurance to continue to cover their you know, anti-rejection medications if they get an infection, et cetera, et cetera. Doesn't the insurance company that is funding, the, that footing that bill, don't they have a stake in trying to figure out what kind of surgery this person had? Was this a bona fide, legitimate process that they went through? And why and how should we pay for something that was done in an erroneous and illegal fashion? I mean, don't they have some responsibility there? The government does as well. So how do, how do these patients get health care coverage after they come here? I don't understand it. Anybody want to add something? I can uh, elaborate, uh, but uh, not necessarily accurate. Um, each state has their own health care insurance policies. Uh, just like the auto insurance, um, they may apply to uh, Maryland, may not apply to Rhode Island or Connecticut. Uh, I have spoken to uh, a legislator in Connecticut, that's the state I'm coming from, uh, we are um, requesting that you know we should uh, the Department of Health of Connecticut should look into this because exactly just like you said, and uh, those patients come back home they um, put a, a lot of burden on the insurance uh, the healthcare expenses, and uh, the answer I I got is not completed yet but uh, um, is um, is like that similar to to uh, auto in, uh, insurance industry. Each state has its their own um, fine detailed policy. They can s say um, that we're, going to, we're not going to um, cover you if you, the organ is from overseas. They can also require the patients when they come back home to report to their uh, doctors or the hospitals where they are going to, to receive uh, care. And I would uh, take this step even further. At the federal level, we have Obamacare is going to be uh, acted a very soon in more than a little over a year. And why can't we at a federal level to um, add amendment stating that, you know, in, in lieu of the uh, health care burden and also uh, a danger to our own citizens, we should make uh, similar changes uh, to add uh, additional clause to the policies. I don't know if, if you um, were following with the, in Israel when he was talking about that law. The doctor that was a heart transplant surgeon that got very interested to help enact new legislation, uh, not only did his patient go to China um, and get a heart transplant, but the insurance company paid for him to go to China and get a hand, and then paid for his expenses in Israel uh, post-surgery. So they changed the whole law. Not only will they pay, not pay now for the, when they come back uh, if, they're, if they're getting it from China, but they won't pay for it uh, for the patient to go. Um, so, and that was very effective, as, as Dr. Xu said. It actually really uh, helped their, their internal transplant system. Yes, please. Do you think that also our economic relations with China is, is an impact on why this hasn't been a bigger story, or we're not really just, is it out there? Absolutely. Um, and I think what's a little bit of a shocker is it occurs at every level of the government. We've had cases where a small town mayor is going to hold a parade or give a proclamation to the local group of Falun Gong practitioners, and he gets a call from the region's uh, Chinese consulate general saying, don't do this or there'll be a replications on your country. So, I mean, it's, we've had it all the way down at the mayor level. We have uh, examples of, of stuff being sent out to our representatives here, both on the House and the Senate side. Um, I don't know if you guys saw the news. I mean, they, they do this at the very highest level. One of the first things that um, 
uh, Junsman did after he initiated the persecution and he saw President, then President Clinton at the APEC meeting in 1999 was hand him a book defaming Falun Gong. One of the first things that envoys from the Chinese consulate did uh, to meet the Condoleezza Rice when Bush was first in office, they had a meeting was to have a couple of people come in and all they were doing is talking about Falun Gong. She finally had to kick him out of the office saying, what do you guys, we're here to conduct some business on other things. So it happens at every level of the government and it's a major problem. Yeah. Further questions? I'm sorry, uh, um, I was late. I don't know if this was talked about, but uh, I work on the Senate side. Is there an effort to get a, a companion resolution? We would love that. <laughs> uh, we just spend a lot of time in the House. I don't know if Larry would want to answer that. Any work being done currently on the Senate side? Yeah, we hope this bill can be passed in the House first, then we'll try to bring it into the Senate. Okay. Further uh, or final questions? Okay, in that case, we really want to thank you for coming. Important, very important topic, and we really help any, any support you can give. If you can grab a copy of the House Resolution 281 on your way out, that would be great. Thank you, everyone.